if you think about what the ideal of an open society is, you, you kind of come with four ideas, it seems to me. The first claim is an epistemological one. Closed societies define the truth of their people. Open societies leave the determination of truth to a free process of scientific falsification. The distinctive feature of Popper's version of liberal democracy is that it put its emphasis on the epistemological basis of what we do. We allow uh, free deliberation to determine uh, public policy and, um, uh, uh, and, 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 and democratic choice. And the epistemological claim is clearly in trouble because we're in this thing called the post-truth society. So the epistemological foundations of liberal democracy are challenged as never before. I think the second aspect of open society is, is a political claim, which is that closed societies favor mass coercion, single-party domination. Open societies privilege a politics that Popper called piecemeal social engineering. And the miracle that is Western liberal prosperity since 1945 is the result of piecemeal social engineering, by which I mean learning from your mistakes. God knows we've made mistakes getting to the Netherlands of 2017, but we got there with piecemeal social engineering, massive public debate, resistance argument, and incrementally we produce this enormous edifice of, of wealth. But that piecemeal social engineering leaves people enormously discontented. Where is the vision? Where, are the, where, where, where is the radiant tomorrow? Where is the bright horizon? I'm a big fan being an old-style liberal of piecemeal social engineering, but let's not neglect the discontent it leaves behind. The, the third claim, I think, about open society is a moral claim, which is liberal societies are societies that care about individuals' retail. Individuals matter. We talk a lot about diversity and difference, but the difference that we care about morally is the difference between each of you in the room. Um, and that the value we give to individuals is essentially the moral claim that sus sustains liberal democracy. The final claim is a historical claim. One of the things that open societies and liberal democracy have said for themselves with particular confidence in the 70s and 80s was that in the long run, open societies would prevail over closed ones. That is, there was a, his, a tacit historical narrative in the post-45 world that open societies would eventually win out. And if I think there's one thing that's got us troubled in 2017, it's suddenly a doubt particularly posed by China and other closed societies, as to whether that historical narrative uh, remains true. So those are the claims that essentially undergird a liberal society, epistemological, political, moral, and historical. But there's another thing, that, another thing we need, I think, to say, which is open society itself has changed enormously since 1945. The, the open society that Karl Popper took for granted in 1945 when he was writing is unimaginable or unrecognizable to us now. It was a society of rationing, exchange controls, nationalized industries, confiscatory rates of taxation, mobilization for reconstruction, strongly national cu cultures, strongly monoethnic societies, and held together by, on the one hand, the memory of fascism and the totalitarian threat in the future. And that's a very different um, a situation for open societies. Now we look at a very different open society with free movement of capital, hyper-migration, hyper-connectivity, hyper-diversity, a state that is in some sense, thanks to the neoliberal re revolution, less strong and interventionist than it was in 1945 much higher levels of inequality in 2017 than, were take, than, than, the, than the wartime mobilizations uh, in the 1940s, much more oligopoly. Uh, open societies trying to find their bearings and their cultural space in a globalized culture. And this convulsion of change, I think, has produced within open society 
a deep nostalgia for the open society of the past, which was in fact a much more closed society than uh, we, we are used to now. If open societies have claimed, it's, it's also the case that closed societies have changed enormously. If you think of the closed society of 1945, it was autarky, socialism in one country, um, sealed frontiers, no exit, no voice, and loyalty based on coercion, to use Albert Hirschman's exit voice and loyalty distinctions. If you flash forward to 2017, our closed societies are unrecognizably different. They've been inserted into the global capitalist economy. They function on what could be called rule by law as opposed to rule of law. Crucially, they allow, they allow exit, exit but no voice, and a loyalty based on nationalism. But these are very different than the Soviet communist regimes or the Chinese communist regimes that we faced in the Cold War. And one of the elements that I think is most difficult in thinking about the future of open society is the collusive relationship between open societies in 27 and closed societies to a degree that we need to that pose the biggest questions in international relations and international security is whether open societies are essentially maintaining closed societies. Think about it for a minute. Um, Chinese, uh, Chinese capitalism allows anybody who's unhappy with the internal party regime to offshore their resources in Vancouver or Amsterdam or London. Um, anybody who is unhappy with Hungary can exit through Schengen. These open and closed societies are in a collusive, mutually dependent relationship, which poses huge questions for international relations. Should we buy access markets? Uh, should we buy market access in China in return for allowing, essentially, the stability of single-party rule in China? Have we made our bed with a state capitalist authoritarianism in China? This kind of regime, precisely because it has insertion into the capitalist world, may be much more stable. It may have a much longer future in the 21st century than the closed societies that we thought we'd beaten after 1989. The same dilemma is posed by the liberal democracies in, in Eastern Europe, Hungary and Poland. These societies are parasitic on the openness of, of uh, Western Europe. But Western Europe faces a dilemma. If, you, if they enforce a community of values, if they say Europe has to stand for something, there's a risk that these two societies and many other societies in Eastern Europe will simply back out of the club. So we have the dilemma of can we bring them back into the fold of genuinely open societies, or is there a risk that when we do so, we precipitate them further on the trajectory of becoming a closed society. Um, so these issues of collusion between open and closed societies are not usually posed, but they, they seem to me to be critical to the future of the international relations of liberal democracies uh, as a whole. Another way to think about the relationship between open and closed societies is the other side of the coin, which is the ways in which closed societies are now directly intervening in our own democracies. Nobody can look at the cyber interference in the election processes in Western Europe and in the United States without having deep alarm at the ways in which closed societies are now intervening and manipulating and trying to shape public opinion in open ones. And this raises questions about how we manage cyberspace and uh, the internet, and whether we can do so consistent with our own valued freedoms. How do we safeguard literally the integrity of our democracies through the 21st century? Seems to me a question we're now fumbling to find answers for. The challenge to open societies don't stop there. Need to say, I hardly need to mention the fact that the vision of an open society is challenged by the border question. 
almost everybody, if asked, in our democratic publics, when asked, do you like the idea of an open society, they say, sure, we like an open society, but we'd like closed borders. And so we're living in that contradiction. Um, openness and human rights, a similar conflict. Um, the majoritarian populism we're seeing sweeping through the world is increasingly resistant to international human rights invigilation from the outside. As you know, I come from a perfect country, Canada, a country without blemish. Um, but even we resent external human rights invigilation of some of the domestic problems we have. And that resentment at outside invigilation of open societies grows with every day. And it's not just any more confined to closed societies. The resentment is very strong in open societies as well. Another conflict, another, I'm raising questions rather than answers. I think I'll have a, the odd answer later on, I hope. Um, one of the other challenges about an open society goes back to the first point I made, which is that these societies have an epistemological basis. We believe in a marketplace of ideas. We believe that facts are stubborn things. Facts are objective. Facts can be found. Why does WRR exist? It exists because it believes there is such a thing as a fact. They do believe that Mr. Ruta, your prime minister, would decide a little better if he decided on the basis of facts. So the rationale of the whole outfit is based on a certain epistemology. And yet, there's no question that the authority of the scientific people in this room is challenged as never before. We all know the Brexit, Mr. Gov's infamous remark about the people being tired of experts. But this is a challenge to professional authority and professional expertise that spreads, that challenges the legitimacy of everybody in this room, including me. Um, and it results in a strong kind of anti-empirical majoritarianism in which the test of truth is what a majority believe to be true. And that is a recurrent challenge to democracy in all ages, but I've, I never expected in my lifetime to see that challenge to be as strong, persistent, and angry and ressentiment filled as it is now. And that must, that must connect to the fact that the professionals who have scientific authority, the professionals who have um, authority based on their expertise are doing extremely well financially. So resentment, epistemologically based resentment is also connected to class resentment in a mixture which is potentially toxic, frankly, for all of us. Um, and there's another challenge as well which relates to what I said earlier about the ways in which closed societies are manipulating our democracy. There's some challenges inside to democracy that we need to think about. You could almost ask whether open society is destroying democracy. That's a provocative question. It can't be true, but there's some element of it that is disturbingly true at the moment. Um, if you look at what the digital revolution has done to democracy, the digital revolution is premised on openness, on frontierless digital communications. But it's having a couple of effects that we're all struggling to, to think about. One of them is what I would call virtual disinhibition. Let me tell you a story from my political life. As you know, I was fantastically successful in politics, so I got an opportunity to lecture you about politics at, at length. Um, uh, but one of the things I noticed in politics is that I shook many thousands of hands in the five years that I had my triumphant political career. And Precisely because it was so triumphant, one of the things I learned is that I never had a disagreeable word with any fellow citizen when I was face to face. Astoundingly, the rules of decorum prevailed in democracy. The internet was something else. It was so awful that my wife said, you're not going to survive if you, if you click on any links referring to you. You'll, you just, you'll curl up and die. So that's an example of what I would call virtual disinhibition, we've unleashed a monster in our politics, which is anonymous comment on the internet. The disinhibiting effect of anonymous comment is producing a kind of rage and hatred and contempt in politics, 
which used to be disciplined by face -to -face, the face-to-face -face interactions of the democratic agora. And so we're in a new situation. The other component of that, or related phenomenon, I would call algorithmic segregation. You may know it by the term filter bubbles. We are all increasingly prisoners, and we are as much prisoners as anybody else, of the bubbles of information within which we work. And the public space in which we make common decisions and share common factual bases for argument and policy determination is fragmenting. And one of the ways that I think, one of the things we need as policy professionals to avoid is the thought that we are not in a filter bubble. It's those poor other people who are. Folks, let's wake up. We're all in a filter bubble. My filter bubble just happens to have the New York Times in it. But let's not assume, or you have, you know, the Volksrand or whatever it is. We're all in filter bubbles. And, and this is reducing our capacity for shared, the, the, the rough shared experience, the rough sense of common fate on which a democratic politics uh, uh, depends. All of this has been accompanied, as I said earlier, by an attack on, on, on expertise. An open society is creating enormous amounts of cultural anxiety, a sense of almost a sense that open society is a contradiction in terms because a society has to have boundaries. Where are the boundaries here? Where are the boundaries in terms of culture? Where are the boundaries in terms of language? Where are the boundaries in terms of frontier? Um, I, I'm very struck by the, the sense of cultural anxiety that, sustain, that, that is alive across uh, Western democracies and is wrongly dismissed by experts and sophisticated people like us as if it's an anxiety that only they have. I think the anxiety is much more widely and generally shared. Um, one of the phenomena, again, that's taught everybody by surprise is that open society was premised on an idea of open markets. Free trade, international free trade, to a degree that's caught everybody by surprise, suddenly free trade is not working for broad swaths of democratic electorates. And this is producing uh, an extraordinarily turbulent uh, condition in which the founders of open society, people like Popper, people like Schumpeter, talked about the creative destruction of capitalism and now people feel only that the destruction is anything but um, creative. So the very defense of an open international economy has come into question as never before. One additional feature, I'm giving you nothing but the negative story. I Believe me, before I sit down, and I'll sit down a few, in a minute or two, uh, I'll, I, I hope I can end on a more positive note. When you put all these phenomena together, one of the things I noticed in, in, again, my brilliant political career is the ways in which across Western democracies we've replaced, perhaps less so in the Netherlands because you have coalition politics and a different electoral system, perhaps less in Germany, but in many other countries we've replaced a politics of adversaries with a politics of enemies. Adversary is a person you oppose today and you ally with tomorrow. An enemy is someone who wants to destroy you. We've created a politics of enemies. Um, American politics is a politics of enemies. People, you don't simply oppose them. They, stand, they oppose everything that you believe in and stand for, and they must be destroyed. That politics of enemies is tremendously destructive of democracy because one of the unstated premises of democracy is someone who loses an election today could win it the day after tomorrow. Um, and one of the geniuses of democracy is that it finds a way to handle loss as well as victory so that those who lose stay in the game in the hopes that they can win. And that dynamic is sustained by the logic of adversaries, not enemies. Uh, and we are creating a politics of enemies which is deeply destructive of the, of, the, uh, of the political fabric and also divisive and destructive of the social fabric as well. And one of the phenomenon of the, of the politics of enemies that is of the greatest concern 
is the ways in which um, a politics of enemies is what, doing what I would call confiscating the virtues. I now have a short political plug for my book called The Ordinary Virtues. Uh, normal service is now resumed, plug over. Um, the confiscation of virtue refers to something I think we've all seen from 2015 to 2017 in Europe. Spontaneous demonstrations of compassion, mercy, solidarity, and friendship in, the, in September 2015 by populations who, for example, flooded to railway stations to aid and assist refugees has been replaced by a language of border closing and shutting off the frontier and shutting out strangers, which I don't think, I think the way to understand it is that it's a confiscation of generosity, compassion, and mercy by political language. If you live in the country I live in, it would be easy to think that Hungarians lack mercy, compassion, and generosity because the unrelenting discourse from the top is to show compassion, mercy, or solidarity to anybody who's not a Hungarian is a betrayal of being Hungarian. Generosity has been recoded as betrayal. This is what I mean by the confiscation of virtue, and it is fatal to a country. It is fatal to a country because it's ultimately corrosive of the generosity, compassion, and mercy necessary to the internal coition of a society. So all of this, virtual disinhibition, algorithmic segregation, the attack on expertise, the weakening support for open markets, the empowerment of a politics of enemies versus a politics of adversaries, culminating in the, cul the confiscation of the virtues. We're in a tough time, folks. I, I, I sometimes think kind of, I've given you a kind of cold shower down your neck. I, it, it's not, I'm actually fiercely optimistic about the future of liberal democracy. You wouldn't know it from what I've said. But I actually think the only way to to get to optimism is to look it squarely in the face and some of the problems. What do I conclude, and I really will conclude quickly? If you go back to the open society of 1945, one of the things you realize is how much Popper's vision of an open society depended on a strong sovereign state. It was not the open society of... Um, neoliberal uh, in, in openness. These were so, open societies that were sovereign. Sovereignty requires strong states, capable states, states with tax capacity, states with the capacity to coerce, states with the capacity to collaborate with others. This is not a peon to Brexit, let me tell you. You can't be a strong state in the modern world unless you collaborate with others. I think the Netherlands has understood how, how their own sovereignty is integrally dependent on uh, uh, European integration. But a strong state is only a strong state to the degree that it creates equal starting conditions for all citizens for the sake of inclusion, for the sake of cohesion. But also strong states are states that control their borders. Again, a message from the perfect country, Canada, our famous generosity and welcome for refugees and migrants is premised on border control. You can't have generosity for strangers unless you can tell your own citizens your borders are under control. That's how it works in the modern world. A strong state is the condition of compassion and generosity, not its reverse. Strong states in the modern world will have to control cyberspace for the existential reason that if they don't control cyberspace, they won't be able to preserve the integrity of their own democracy. I don't know how to do it, folks, but this seems to me an extremely urgent uh, public policy problem. Sa almost to last, strong states need strong citizens. People like you, participatory, demanding, informed, difficult. They show up at meetings on rainy Thursday nights. They demand accountability. They push 
states to perform. They don't sit out elections. They come and vote. The culture of civic engagement and participation is crucial to a strong state. People who think strong state means weak citizens don't understand. You only have strong states when you have strong citizens. And finally, almost my last word, strong states need strong institutions. Free media, free courts, free professions, free universities. One of the terrible discoveries of defending a free institution in a place like Hungary is the only way I can get leverage on the Hungarian government is from the outside, going to Washington, going to Berlin, going to Brussels, going to The Hague, because the domestic institutions have been decisively weakened by seven or eight years of single-party majoritarian rule. Without strong institutions, you can't have strong states. It's not a contradiction to have a strong state and have a strong media, strong courts, strong countervailing institutions. This is, it seems to me, points us in the direction of a very different vision of open society in which open society is conditional on sovereignty, conditional on states with the capacity to enforce and defend the conditions of life for their citizens. Thank you so much for your attention.